Switzerland lies along the Alpine mountain chain, which forms a natural barrier between northern and southern Europe. The majestic peaks are indented by deep valleys, along which natural thoroughfares have developed over the centuries, with early footpaths and mule tracks being transformed into major highways. The road across the Simplon Pass, whose summit lies at just over 2,000 meters above sea level, was initially built by the Romans in the second century AD. During the Middle Ages, it became one of the principal north-south thoroughfares, heavily used by merchants, pilgrims, and soldiers traveling between northern Europe and Italy. The principal settlement at the northern end of the pass is Brieg, whose impressive streets and churches testify to its importance as the gateway between Switzerland and Italy. The town's best-known landmark is the Stockalper Palace, built in the middle of the 17th century. This stately complex, with its three towers named after the biblical three wise men, was once the largest private residence in the whole country. It was built by Caspar Jodok von Stockalper, who financed his grandiose scheme with some of the enormous wealth gained from his control of the lucrative goods traffic over the Simplon Pass. The courtyard next to the palace was originally the business heart of the complex, with pack animals constantly arriving and departing, laden with all manner of exotic wares. Today it's the ideal location for a quiet stroll and a popular venue for musical concerts. In the days of Caspar Stockalper, the road was the only way into Italy. But in 1876, the coming of the railways along the Rhone Valley from Geneva heralded a new era. After Brieg, however, the railway builders were faced with the enormous challenge of taking the line south to connect with the Italian railway at Domodossola. Their solution was to excavate a bore almost 20,000 meters in length, the longest in Europe until the opening of the Channel Tunnel in 1994. Work began on the excavation in 1898, and the first tunnel was open to traffic within eight years. The second bore, based on the parallel access tunnel used during the original construction, came into operation some 15 years later. The arrival of the railway from Italy in 1906 led to an overwhelming demand to open a direct route to Bern and northwestern Switzerland. And that same year, the bern lurchberg simplon company was formed. Work began almost immediately to build a new line from Brieg to Frutigen, while two existing companies, the spitz frutigen bahn and the Tunisie Railway, were absorbed to complete the link. All work was completed in time for the opening of the line on the 15th of July, 1913. Since its opening, the BLS company has been part of a four-member group, Switzerland's second largest private railway company, comprising the BLS Lurchbergbahn, the bern nurschetter Railway, the spitz erlenbach zweizimmern Railway, and the gürbetel bern schwarzenbergbahn For our journey along the BLS line to Thun, we'll be joining the EC Vauban service, which originates in Milan. She arrives from Italy hauled not by an Italian loco, but by a BLS RE44. Although the Swiss-Italian border lies in the middle of the Simplon Tunnel, the Swiss Federal Railway is responsible for the catenary as far as Domodossola Station, some 30 kilometers into Italy. At Brieg, the locomotive is changed and three BLS coaches are attached with the new machine. Unlike most Swiss railway companies, the BLS used electric traction from the opening of the line. A power system of 15,000 volts AC at 16 two-thirds cycles was installed, proving so successful that the SBB adopted it when they electrified their network in the 1920s. Our way lies along the Rhone Valley as far as Hutten, where we turn northwards and run through the Lurchberg Tunnel into the lush Kanda Valley. Journey's end will be at the lakeside town of Thun. Brieg station lies alongside the river Rhone, which is about 50 meters wide at this point. The tracks of the Fokker Oberalp towards Andermatt run away to our right, 
while we cross the river and begin our westward climb up the side of the Rhone Valley. We have to gain 400 meters in height before reaching Houghton Station at the entrance of the Lonza Gorge. In order to ensure relatively high speeds along the line, it was decided to use only adhesion working with a maximum gradient of 1 in 37. The adoption of standard gauge tracks by the BLS enables trains to interconnect with the SBB lines throughout the system and for the easy passage of goods wagons throughout Europe. The track clings to the edge of the steep mountain sides, giving superb views into the Rhone Valley. The locomotive hauling our train is an RE44, the main workhorses of the BLS. 35 of these were purchased between 1964 and 1983 from SLM with electrical equipment by BBC. They are painted in the traditional BLS brown livery and each bears the name and badge of a community associated with the group. Their top speed capability of 140 km per hour is never achieved along the Lurchberg line, although their 6,500 horsepower enables them to easily haul international trains up the steep gradients of this mountainous route. The tunnel at Eckerberg station is one of 20 found on the southern ramp of the line. The steepness of the valley side, the gradients needed to achieve the summit and the number of ravines to be crossed posed a severe combination of problems for the railway builders resolved by the construction of numerous tunnels and bridges. Meagre funds determined that the permanent way be initially constructed a single track, although from the very first two-line running was envisaged. Work to achieve the second line was begun in 1976, but the complexity of the task and the necessity to maintain normal service meant that it was 15 years before completion. The steep valley sides meant that much of the new track had to be built on concrete buttresses projecting from the rock face, while the majority of the viaducts and bridges along the line, originally constructed for single track running, needed to be modified or extended to take the additional rails. Only the Beechtel Bridge was built with the capacity to take a second track. Its steel girder construction, assembled on a curve between two tunnels, was capable of being easily adapted, a foresighted step taken in view of its remote location. The new work not only enabled the bridge to take the second track, but at the same time a footbridge was added, enabling ramblers and railway enthusiasts alike to take a close view of the line. A special footpath has been built between Houghton and Lalden, intercrossing with the line and stations at various points along the way. Some of the route passes along the former track bed and tunnels of the narrow gauge railway used during the construction of the line. The Balchseder viaduct at the western portal of the Eckerberg tunnel was originally constructed with a central iron truss resting on stone piers. It was almost completely rebuilt during the track widening, the new work being carried out in concrete. Secondary pillars were tied into the original stonework and a modern version of the fish belly girder replaced the main span.
The 28-metre-long Victoria Tunnel, the shortest on the line, gained its name due to the resemblance of the rock outcrop to the profile of the English Queen Victoria, complete with tiara. The graceful 136 metre long Beachtal Bridge raises the track 78 metres above the valley floor, the highest structure on the entire line. The Luoglkin viaduct appears at first sight to be a single structure. However, when the line was doubled, a second viaduct was constructed in concrete alongside the original stone bridge and then given a matching cladding. Entering the 1,346 metre long Hoten Tunnel turns us northwards into the narrow Lonza Gorge.
A series of tunnels and galleries protects the tracks from avalanche danger, so the views from our windows are only fleeting. During the doubling of the line, the steepness of the valley side necessitated excavating a new tunnel, over three kilometers long, deeper into the mountain. Gorpenstein, at 1,217 meters above sea level, is the highest station on the entire BLS group network. Our train has climbed more than 500 meters since the start of our journey at Brieg. The train makes connections here with the post buses, which take walkers and sightseers along the picturesque Lurchenthal. This lovely valley with its villages of sun-darkened wooden chalets and barns has been inhabited for centuries, although before the advent of the railway and motor traffic, it was only accessible by mule track. The traditional occupation of farming is today augmented by tourism, although the region remains unspoiled. The lush meadows, wooded slopes and sparkling streams attract large numbers of visitors here every summer. The road ends at Fafaralp, where there are superb views along the valley towards the tongue of the Langlacher, part of the enormous Alich Glacier complex. This 23-kilometer ice sheet, the longest in Europe, extends for more than 100 square kilometers between the peaks of the Bernese Oberland and the Rhone Valley. The high mountain ridges dividing the Lurchenthal from the Kanda Valley proved a serious obstacle to the railway builders. After Gorpenstein, a summit tunnel was proposed, running in a dead straight line below the peaks of the Lurchberg and the river Kanda. Building began from either end in October 1906, and for the first 18 months work progressed steadily. In July 1908, catastrophe struck, when the men blasting at the northern face broke into a deep fissure below the bottom of the Gaston Valley, and the tunnel rapidly filled with a torrent of water and mud. The miners had struck not the solid rock predicted by the surveyors, but liquid glacial debris below the bed of the river Kanda. Twenty-five Italian miners were killed, and work ceased for six months while alternative routes were considered. It was finally decided to make a diversion in a large arc to the northeast, cutting the line through stable rock below the river, the ill-fated section of the northern bore having already been sealed off. The breakthrough occurred on the 31st of March 1911, with an almost perfect alignment achieved. Within a year, it had been expanded to full width, and the official opening took place on the 15th of July 1913. There's no through road over the mountain ridge, and a year-round car shuttle service has been operating between Goppenstein and Kantersteg since 1960. An average of 1.3 million cars and coaches are transported through the tunnel each year, and on one day in 1994, a staggering 13,500 vehicles used the shuttle, a record for any one 24-hour period. This system is so successful that when the Channel Tunnel rail link between Britain and France was constructed, there was close cooperation between the BLS and Eurotunnel over potential designs and testing. The Lurchberg Tunnel, at 14,612 metres, is the fourth longest in Switzerland. Unlike the remainder of the line, it was built to accommodate double track running from its inception. The track climbs gently to reach the summit of the route inside the tunnel at 1,240 metres above sea level. A maximum of eight trains and car shuttles can run through the four-block section at any one time, and our train can achieve its top speed for the journey here of some 125 kilometres per hour. We emerge in the Kanda Valley and have now passed from Canton Valley into Canton Bern as the boundary line runs across the middle of the tunnel. On the outskirts of the station, we pass the car transporter complex, 
with a loaded set waiting for the green signal. The picturesque village of Kandersteg is a popular year-round holiday center. During winter months, skiers take full advantage of the surrounding facilities, with a variety of loips available to suit all ages and abilities. Spring transforms the thick snow into tumbling meltwater, feeding both the Kanda River and the Ashinansi, a glacial lake lying in the mountains behind the village. Strenuous hikers can enjoy the delights of the wild mountain scenery along the Gastentau, or take the path following the northern ramp of the railway. After Kandersteg, our way lies downhill to Frutigen, before reaching the shores of Lake Thun at Spitz. The valley now makes a steep descent and we must lose almost 400 meters in height before our train makes its next stop at Frutigen station. A direct line down the slope would have meant using rack assistance and in order to avoid this and keep up train speeds, the line was artificially lengthened by being laid in three loops back and forward along the eastern side of the valley. This section of the line employs the maximum one in 37 gradient. We've now reached the end of the first level of track and entered a loop tunnel some 1,655 meters in length. The route will run back up the valley before making a large open air curve at Blasi Mitholz to resume its northerly course. lies the ruins of the Welzenburg Castle, one of the strongholds built along this valley during the Middle Ages. The North Ramp footpath runs near the tracks along this section, giving enthusiasts plenty of opportunity to view trains at close hand. At Blausi, the train passes round a 300-meter radius curve, the tightest on any main line in Switzerland, to return the track to its northbound route. 
The 1 in 37 gradient is maintained throughout, but the BLS locomotives can easily hold their speed climbing or descending. Hidden in the woods near our tracks lies the Blousey, whose name reflects the intense color of this tranquil lake. The park complex has been popular with tourists since its opening at the end of the 19th century. Visitors can take a leisurely ride in one of the special boats and see at close hand the variety of underwater life and submerged petrified fir trees. The lake bed was formed about 15,000 years ago as a result of an avalanche of rocks and ice blocks. When the ice sheet receded from the valley, the shallow depression filled with water. The constant temperature of the lake, about 7 degrees centigrade in both summer and winter, means it never freezes over, so it's the perfect environment for the hundreds of trout which live there. The water's exceptional purity reflects the colors from the sky and surrounding foliage, to give the beautiful blue and green tones which are so pleasing to the eye. After Blousey, our way continues along the side of the Kanda Valley towards Frutigen. We've now left the tunnels behind and can enjoy the view without hindrance. The wooden sleepers which carry the track are made from beech. They're renewed every 25 years at the same time as the ballast is cleaned and repacked, the work now being fully mechanized. Rail life is shorter, around 10 years, and the continuous welded track now used contributes to the quiet and comfortable running of our train. After Kandergrund, the railway crosses over the valley floor on two viaducts which form an impressive landmark. The original stone arch structure, built in 1911, is 285 meters long, the longest viaduct on the whole line. Since 1980, it's been joined by a modern pre-stress concrete viaduct built for the doubling of the tracks, at 282 meters, slightly shorter than its neighbor, though a fraction higher at just over 28 meters. The station at Frutigen predates the opening of the Lurchberg line, as it was the terminus of the former Spitz Frutigen railway, which operated from 1901 to 1906. The Frutigen Valley is largely an agricultural region. However, it also contains a flourishing industry which has given employment to local artisans for well over a century. Boxes from wood shavings have been made here by the Buller family for three generations. Their major customer originally was the match trade, which flourished around Frutigen during the last half of the 19th century. Such boxes have been used for a variety of purposes throughout the ages, from protecting fragile goods in transit to storing the best Sunday bonnet. 
Still made in the traditional way, nowadays a specially modified machine cuts the fine slivers of wood needed to make the boxes. In earlier times, the strips were produced with the aid of a special bench, and the craft called for a keen eye and a strong back. The supple wood strips are assembled into boxes by a team of dedicated outworkers, whose practiced fingers make light work of the skilled task. A smooth join is essential, so the wood is chamfered at the seam, then bonded together with a thin layer of strong adhesive. Once the glue has dried, the clamps can be removed and the box is prepared for decorating. A fascinating museum is attached to the workshop, displaying a variety of colorful boxes collected from around the world. By Frutigen, we've completed just over two-thirds of our journey and have a gentle ride ahead of us down the Kanda Valley towards Lake Thun. We're now travelling over the tracks of the former Spitz Frutigenbahn. The line opened on the 25th of July 1901, but was only operated by the SFB for five years before being taken over by the BLS. The original steam locomotives continued to haul trains until 1911, when the section was electrified, two years before the opening of the whole route. These days, along the north ramp, trains stop only at Kandersteg and Frutigen. Local services having ceased in 1992, apart from the shuttle between Spitz and Reichenbach. Other villages are now served by the BLS bus service. The way along the valley floor is gentle and our ruling gradient has been reduced from 1 in 37 to 1 in 66. The river Kanda, whose waters we've been following along the north ramp, runs into Lake Thun and on through northern Switzerland to join the River Rhine. At Mulinen, our train passes the Niesenbahn, which opened in 1910 to take visitors up the steep slopes of the Niesen mountain. From the summit, at 2,362 meters above sea level, the best views of the region can be seen. The three and a half kilometers of track utilizes a gradient of one in 1.5 to take the funicular over 1,600 meters in height. Along the Niesenbahn lies a flight of 1,674 steps the longest in the world, 
for exclusive use of maintenance workers. Though permission is granted for an occasional running race up the stairway, which tests the fitness of the contestants to the limit. The breathtaking views from the summit have been admired for many years. A guest house was built here as early as 1856, with a wine cellar hewn into the rocky summit, no doubt much appreciated by the travelers who would have arrived on foot or horseback. Lake Toon lies at the base of the peak, and from this height, the entire 17-kilometer stretch of water is clearly visible, with a distant view of Lake Brienz and the town of Interlaken. On a clear day, there are magnificent vistas over the entire Bernese Oberland, with the snow-covered peaks of the Eiger, Munk and Jungfrau dominating the skyline. The valley along which our train has been running stretches up towards Kandersteg and the mountain ridge lying above the Lurchberg Tunnel. The view from our train is now restricted as the tracks run along the thickly wooded banks of the Kanda River. We passed through a final tunnel some 1,607 meters long before emerging beside the depot at Spitz, the main works of the BLS group. On the outskirts of the station, our tracks merge with those from Interlaken. The first station was built here in 1893, when the Tunisie Bahn opened their line along the southern shore of the lake. The harbour at Spitz is a pleasing combination of old and new. The modern marina and shoreline hotels lie beneath the walls of the ancient castle, which stands on a promontory with a commanding view of the centre of the lake. The original stone tower was constructed in the 11th century, but the various families who owned the stronghold enlarged it over the generations. In the grounds stands a Romanesque church, which houses monuments to the former castle owners. Today the castle contains a museum and offices, as well as private apartments. It's a romantic location for wedding receptions and a popular conference venue. The region around Lake Toon was favoured by visitors from the middle of the 19th century, and the railway builders were quick to see the advantage of improved transport. In 1872, the Bördelibahn opened their line from Derligen to Interlaken West, with an extension to Bönigen made two years later. Trains were steam hauled and special double-decker coaches were used for maximum passenger carrying capacity. The terminus stations lay beside jetties and visitors from all over Europe could now travel by train and paddle boat to the heart of the Bernese Oberland. It was not until 1893 that a rail link was built from Derligen to Scherzligen where a connection could be made with the SCB line to Bern. 
In 1901, the first route along the Kanda Valley was opened by the Spitz Frutigenbahn, the various companies all being absorbed by the BLS in time for the opening of the Lurchberg route in 1913. Today, BLS trains leave from Interlaken Ost as the original lakeside terminus at Bernigen was closed in the late 1960s, although there's still a works complex there. The station, formerly known as Customs House Halt, was built by the Bern Oberland Bernois Railway when they opened their lines to Lauterbrunnen and Grindelwald in 1890. The complex contains both meter and standard gauge tracks, as it's used by the SBB and BLS, as well as the BOB. Many of the local services from Interlaken to Spitz are operated with RBDE 44 push pull sets, part of the modern fleet purchased in the 1980s and used throughout the group. These thyristor controlled NPZs were built by SIG and SWS with electrics by BBC and have a top speed of 125 kilometers per hour. After Interlaken, the line closely follows the shore of Lake Thun, giving magnificent views across the water. The route to Spitz is single track except at stations, so the frequent local and international trains along this stretch must be carefully scheduled to avoid delays. Before we rejoin the EC Vauban for the remainder of our journey, we can take the opportunity to visit the modern depot at Spitz, the main workshop for the whole group. The original complex, constructed in 1910 for the opening of the BLS line, has been gradually expanded over the years as successive rebuilding programs have taken place, the most recent halls being opened in 1986. Locomotives are repaired and maintained here, and a skilled workforce and modern facilities combine to keep stock in top condition and out of service for as short a time as possible. Faulty bogies can be swiftly removed from locomotives with the assistance of a special purpose-built pit. While the old set is put into a holding bay for repair, new wheels can be fitted to enable the locomotive to be back on the rails in full working order within a matter of hours. If other repairs need to be carried out, a temporary bogey can be attached to enable the loco to be easily moved around the depot. From the beginning, the BLS operated with electric traction, the first main line in Switzerland to use the new method of propulsion. In 1910, the BLS purchased an experimental machine from SLM, which remained in good service after the opening of the line, but was broken up in 1968. Prior to the inauguration of services, the railway commissioned 13 BE57 locomotives from SLM. These machines of 2,500 horsepower were the most powerful electric locos in the world at that time. With the coming of later machines in the 1940s, their days were numbered, and sadly they've now all gone, apart from number 151, which is on display at the Transport Museum in Luzern. These were joined in the 1920s by 17 CE46 machines, later converted to CE44s. They were built by SLM BBC as mixed traffic locomotives, and several are still in use on the network for light goods and engineering trains. A few years later, four BE68 locomotives were commissioned from Breeder of Milan with electrics by Secheron. These were upgraded to AE68s in the 1940s, when four additional machines were purchased from SLM to replace the aging BE57 locomotives on mainline duties. In the 1940s, eight AE44s joined the fleet. In keeping with the BLS's foresighted policy, this was an advanced design of Loco, the first electric machine to achieve 1,000 horsepower per axle. 
four were combined into AE88 locomotives in the mid-1960s to join the three double locos already purchased from SLM. The most modern members of the BLS fleet are the RE465 locomotives designed to augment the RE44s as the main motive power along the Lurchberg line. Eight machines were ordered from SLM with electrical equipment by ABB and the first was accepted into service at the end of 1994. They have a prodigious 9,500 horsepower and are the world's most powerful four-axle locomotive. The remainder of our journey will take us along the southwestern shore of the lake to our destination at Thun. We're now running along the former Tunisie Barn metals, first laid in 1893. Originally, the line was single track, but the BLS inaugurated double running in 1914 to cope with the additional traffic over the newly opened Lurchberg route. Our way passes gently downhill, for Toon is the lowest station on the line at 560 metres above sea level. On the outskirts of Thun, we pass through the original Scherzlingen station and leave BLS territory. The track inside Thun station has been SBB property since 1902, when they took over the complex from the Schweizerische Zentralbahn, whose connection from Bern opened in 1859. Just a short step away from the station, we can continue to travel with the BLS by taking to the water on one of their fleet of boats, which ply their trade on lakes Thun and Brienz. The first paddle steamer to operate in the Bernese Oberland was the DS Bellevue, which came into service on Lake Thun in 1835. Other ships were soon found on both stretches of water as the region's popularity as a tourist centre increased. In 1912, the Lake Thun Steamboat Company amalgamated with the Tunisie Railway Company, both becoming the property of the BLS on the 1st of January the following year. By the end of the 19th century, many large paddle steamers had been commissioned, most continuing to give sterling service until the 1950s. Today, the majority of boats are motor-powered, with many bearing the names of earlier steam vessels. On Lake Brienz, DS Lurchberg is the last survivor of the earlier fleet. She's been in continuous service since her arrival in 1914, having undergone various modifications and renovations over the decades. During summer months, she makes daily trips around the lake and is greatly in demand for special outings. In 1906, DS Blumlesalp was commissioned, the last paddle steamer to be launched on Lake Thun. In 1971, she was taken out of service, but after a program of restoration, has returned to her old waters to bring steam operation back to the lake. In 1993, she took part in a special race against her younger colleague, motorship Jungfrau. It was a perfect day on the lake with a light breeze and warm spring sunshine. She was built by the Escher Wies Company of Zurich and at over 60 meters in length and 13 meters beam is the longest and broadest boat on the lake. She has a twin cylinder compound horizontal engine capable of producing 600 horsepower. Her two oil-fired boilers produce superheated steam at a pressure of 170 pounds per square inch. Captain Möhner knew that the honor of the Blumlisalp lay in his hands as he skillfully brought the best out of the vessel, while avoiding the numerous small craft which clustered around the racing ships. 
The two boats were well matched throughout, but it was the senior vessel which crossed the finishing line first, a popular win for the grand old lady of the lake. From the international crossroads of the Rhone Valley to the majestic scenery of the Bernese Oberland, the BLS will convey you in comfort and ease along the impressive Lurchberg Line.